Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this session. I hope you are enjoying the KubeCon. My name is Sohan Gunkerkar. I work at Red Hat as a senior software engineer. I'm working on Cryo and Signode specific projects. Today, along with me, we have. So um, I'm J Julien Ropé. I'm uh, working for Red Hat as a software developer. I'm also a contributor to Cryo. And I am involved to uh, the Kata containers and the confidential containers projects too. So um, today we want to talk about what happened in Cryo in the past months following our graduation uh, within the CNCF. Um, we will talk about uh, how the project behave at the community level here. Uh, so this is showing uh, the number of stars that we have on the GitHub project. Uh, this is a steady incline, as you can see, over the years. Uh, it is showing uh, uh, growing interest into the project and follows uh, all the work we do to keep having more contributors and uh, contributions to the project. Um, as part of it, the work we are doing to get more contributors include uh, working with uh, mentorship programs with uh, like the LFX mentorship. So we had successful contribution following that. Uh, so yeah, we, we, see, we see a steady number of commits and contributors going on uh, at the community level. So we can say uh, the project is in good, sh good shape uh, and is seeing uh, traction. Um, Next, uh, so just a glimpse of what we are going to release in the next release, 1.30. Um, so this is just a, a small number of the things that are going into that release. So uh, first, we are going to have uh, uh, an easier way to deploy second profiles using OCI artifacts. Um, we're going to release uh, support for the S390 uh, architecture and uh, the enablement for split image file system, which is something that uh, Sohan is going to talk about a little more uh, later on. Uh, so also we added uh, the ability to give time zone information for the pod and containers to, for them to be able to process the local time and um, more internal uh, is in instrumentation of calls with the NRI plugin. So it's just a way to give visualization of internal processes within the cryo uh, components. Uh, so this is it for that. Okay, so more technical pro uh, projects. Um, so this is, we want to talk about what we did to integrate uh, confidential containers support into Cryo. So um, confidential containers is about running uh, your workloads uh, in a trusted environment. And we are doing that by using um, a virtual machine which is running on a hypervisor with uh, the ability to encrypt the memory while it is in use. Uh, the goal is that, well, we already encrypt the disk, we can already encrypt the network connections. Now with confidential container, we can encrypt the memory while it, in, in, while it, while it is in use, sorry. Um, and so even an administrator of the host cannot dump the memory and see what's happening in there. So that's the whole purpose. So that's why I, I, I wrote there, we don't even trust the host. We have to build that trust. So in the next slide, we, we can see uh, how we build that trust. Yep. So this is a, a drawing showing a high level how it is working. Uh, on the left hand side, you have your regular uh, worker node with kubelet, cryo, and at the bottom, so in place of run C, C run, runtime, we have the kata runtime, which is responsible for creating a VM in which your container is, is going to run. Uh, at the center, you see the trusted VM, so it is running on a hypervisor that has hardware support for uh, all the certification attestation. Uh, this is, uh, so typically it is TDX for Intel, it is SAVSNP for AMD, so things like that. Uh, the goal is that when the VM starts, you have this attestation agent that is going to run and verify that everything that runs from the host CPU up to the VM image itself is genuine and has not been altered. Um, so this is done through certification. You have the relying party separate from it, key broker services that helps you validate the certificate that the CPU is giving you. And uh, so the first thing the, the attestation agent does is verify all that stack. And if anything is wrong, it just shut down the VM. So your VM, your workload, your sensitive workload is not even downloaded yet. 
So it is safe. If something goes wrong, it is not touched. If things are validated, then the image management kicks in. Uh, what happens is that the agent is going to talk to the registry, take the image, validate it again with certificates, with attestation, and then decrypt it and run it inside the VM. So this is how Confidential Container works. The way you see it here, you could say, well, the VM is autonomous. It doesn't need anything from the cluster. So why do we need to change cryo for that? And the, the answer is, in order to download the image, we have to know which image we want to download. And that's an information that only the cluster knows. So we have to give a way for the cluster to give that information to the agent somehow. So this is the next slide. Thank you. So how do we do that? Um, our first attempt at doing it was to try to relay the pool image request from Kubernetes directly to the agent inside the VM. Uh, we tried to do that in a proof of concept implementation for both ContainerD and Cryo, but we found that it was very invasive. Uh, the reason for that is even at the CRI level, you can see that there is a clear separation of workflow between the image management and the runtime management. And it has an effect on the implementation because then um, in Cryo, you have clearly separated code paths uh, for image on one side and runtime on the other side. So when we tried to relay the pool image request, we had to make bridges between parts of the code that were not designed to talk together. And we were modifying the workflow even for regular container, which was a bit, uh, a bit big change for something like that. So we had some pushbacks and decided to change our mind. And now we are doing something different where we modify the create container request by adding some additional options to it in the mount options of the create container request. And we do it uh, just while it is being processed. So the idea is to add the small set of information here. You see it is very simple. Uh, the first line is just telling the agent, you have to pull the image actually. And the other one, the, the second one, is giving it the idea of the image to download. The rest of it are optional information that we may use later, but for now, for this feature, the two first line are the only one we need. So this has been implemented in ContainerD using uh, the NIDUS Snapshotter. Um, so Snapshotter plugins are uh, a way for ContainerD to be able to prepare a snapshot for the container before pulling the image. And um, what the NIDUS Snapshotter does in the confidential container uh, situation is to pretend that there is a snapshot and so that ContainerD doesn't pull the image, but instead of preparing it, it is just adding that information. So from ContainerD uh, point of view, there is no change inside the code. It is just the plugin that modifies the behavior. So. Now, how do we do that in Cryo? The fact is that in Cryo, we don't have plugins. We don't have the Snapshotter plugin, so we can just take the Snapshotter plugin from ContainerD and pull it, put it into Cryo. So what we did instead is modify the create container request as we are processing it. Um, this is a much smaller change compared to relaying the pull image request because we have a clear separation of code paths between um, uh, the regular runtimes and the kata container runtimes in cryo. So the change that we did is just modifying the behavior for kata VM-based uh, runtimes. Uh, so that is a change that is already done. It was released with Cryo 1.28. Uh, and uh, now the, the other thing we need to do, which is a work in progress, uh, we have to tell Cryo to not download the image on the, on the host because Cryo is still receiving the pull image request from Kubernetes, so it, it wants to download it. But it is a waste of time, because waste of resources, because we are not going to use that image anyway. And it also can cause an issue because in confidential container, we may have encrypted containers image and we don't want to share the decryption key to the host because we don't trust it. So if we do that, Cryo will pull the image and will not be able to prepare it, it will fail. And if it fails at the pull image request, Kubernetes will not go further and we will never create the container. So we have to teach Cryo to not pull the image. This is still in progress.
So what's next on the confidential container uh, project uh, for Cryo? So we have an alternative way of dealing with images. So you understand that the way I, I explained it before, each VM will have to download its version of the image. So it means that if you run the same container multiple times, you will have to download the image for each one of them. That's again, a lot of resource being used. So we want to provide a way to scale that. And uh, it is always a trade-off in security, but here we want to trust the host just a little bit by letting the host download the image and share it via a volume to the various VMs. So we will have to put in place some encryption. We have to make sure that the image can still be validated to make sure that it is genuine. But this is something that is being done at the confidential container level. It is still being worked on. But when it is ready, we will have to integrate that into Cryo to offer the two possible options. Um, no, uh, <laughs> yeah, just a word about KEP. Uh, the ID, the idea we have is for longer term, trying to make a Kubernetes announcement proposal to try to integrate that workflow a little better into Kubernetes, because today we are more or less hacking into the create container request. We would like to make it a little uh, cleaner. Um, I have this KEP noted, it has nothing to do with confidential container. The reason why I am putting it here is because it is a KEP that is introducing a link between the image spec, the image identification, and the runtime that is going to use it. And this modification is actually helping the gap that I was talking about before, because now there is a link between the image and the runtime, even at the Kubernetes level. So if this KEP goes on, it will actually help us on the confidential container level to do what we were trying to do. So it's probably something we want to do in the future, trying to make our own KEP to be better integrated. Okay, so talking about KEP, um, so this is a signaled uh, uh, some, uh, KEP that we are doing um, about CRI stats and metrics. Um, so we did it uh, some time ago, and it is about modifying the CRI implementation to, um, to make the metrics from pod and, and containers uh, reported by Kubernetes have all those metrics come from the CRI rather than coming from C Advisor. As it is today, the metrics that Kubelet reports are, are coming from both sources some from C Advisor, some from CRI, and it's, first it is a duplication of efforts, but it is also kind of confusing about where the metrics are coming from. Um, and it also requires C Advisor to be aware of the runtime, so there is a dependency of C Advisor on the runtime being used, which is counterintuitive because C Advisor is a higher level component, while Container D and Cryo are just above it. They are talking to the runtime because they are running it, so it makes much more sense for them to report the metrics. So, um, so we are, have this proposal to modify it. Okay. So this is how it is today. So you have those APIs at the top. Uh, you have uh, the C Advisor, Resource, and uh, Summary APIs, which are giving uh, metrics and stats for pods and containers. And uh, some of them are coming from C Advisor and some from CRI. And at the bottom, you have C Advisor being used by Kubelet for the node level stats and the eviction manager. What we want to do next, um, can you? thank you. So what we want to do is to keep the same API because a lot of people are relying on them, so we don't want to change them. Uh, their content will be exactly the same, but their source will be different. Everything will come from the CRI. And uh, at the bottom, this is what we are not changing. Everything for the node level stat and evasion manager are still relying on C Advisor. We are not modifying that. We just want the pod and container metrics to be uh, provided by the CRI. So, uh, status update about that. Uh, we want to have this implemented in the next release, 1.30. We still need support on the container D side. 
Uh, and when we have that, we can move the KEP to beta. So that basically means that the feature is there, it is available, it is feature gated, but people can start using it and try to see, hopefully to see that there is no change because the goal is that the same metrics are available in the same places. So that's it on my side. And now um, Sohan is going to continue with other signal initiative and uh, an idea of what is coming next in the future of cryo. Thanks, Julian, for setting the stage. So before we delve into the specifics of the split image file system update, I want to talk about the common pain points in the world of Kubernetes, the constant battle against the out of space, this space. When provisioning a node, we intend to give adequate amount of storage for containers and for storing container images. Traditionally, container runtime uses a VOD directory to store uh, either in a separate file system or within the root file system. And this is where the problem comes, where you might get some scarcity of disk space. In the context of this, split image file system in Kubernetes 1.30 is a game changer. It's an alpha in state currently, and it uses an approach where it separates the read-only image layer from the writable layer. What it does, it basically isolates the container at the same time addresses the perennial issue of disk scarcity. However, currently there is one limitation. When you separate the container runtime file system, there's a writable layer on the file system presently. If one tries to write to volume or ephemeral storage, then they try to write to NodeFS. So in that way, you will have two writable layers on two file systems. And this cape doesn't address separating the writable layers from the node FS, which is predominantly mentioned for uh, image FS. Now let's discuss about um, the container runtime file system. It has two layers, read-only and the writable layers. Read-only contains image layers where you can spin up the containers without altering the images. And writable layers are basically writing the data on the disk. Combining, we have image FS. Now, if you want to use this feature, you want to configure hccontainerstorage.conf, where you can see on the slide, there's a configuration. For temporary location, you need to use run root, and for persisting data, you should go for graph root. However, there's one caveat. Uh, for some reason, uh, for uh, graph root, you won't be able to persist the data. You might need to change the SLinux label based on what is there in warlib container storage. So why this is important? As I described in the previous slide, it not only solves the problem for this space, but also gives you and provides uh, flexibility in terms of how you want to configure your Kubernetes cluster. Looking ahead, the future looks where we are trying to improve the eviction policies. At the same time, we want to have a clearer uh, ephemeral storage reporting. Since it is going beta in 1.31, we are also planning to have some runtime configuration options. Here's the blog written by one of our uh, Red Hatters if you want to learn more about the technical aspects of it. Now, uh, let's shift our gears and talk about some new frontiers in the container runtime. We are not just talking about uh, some incremental improvements, we are talking about unlocking the potential. Let's start with Wasm. Wasm is a web browser technology. It's a powerful technology which has gone beyond web browsers to something like client and server, tech, uh, server applications. WebAssembly, in a nutshell, is a fast, secure, stack-based virtual machine designed to run binary code without knowing the underlying host and OS resources. Now, in this case, I want to see the benefits of Wasm with Cryo and Kubernetes. So I want to give you some real-time use cases where we feel we might want to target in future. Since Kubernetes is a popular platform for addressing some of the edge computing use cases, with Wasm integration, we are trying to see some agility in terms of enabling multiple architectures. At the same time, Wasm binary is compact, so we are thinking about having some lighter deployments. Imagine a use case where you have a lightweight microservice deployed on cryo containers with, uh, within the Kubernetes world on different edge devices. The second point is dynamic scaling. Kubernetes provides dynamic scaling with the help of VPA and HPA. Here, 
we want to use WASM integration in a place where WASM binaries are compact, which utilizes less disk space. At the same time, there's a rapid startup time, which can be utilized to optimize the resource efficiency. Since we talked about uh, microservices, security is one of the important aspects of it. So let's talk about security-enhanced microservices. Kubernetes, as I mentioned, provides security for microservices with cryos container security. Wasm is like a cherry on the top, where it not only provides a sandbox execution environment, but also gives you model signing for code in order to maintain the integrity and authenticity. At the same time, allow users to tweak runtime configuration without knowing the underlying OS. Last but not the least, Polygot microservices architecture support. Kubernetes has hundreds of microservices support. With Wasm, we are trying to see the potential in adding poly, um, Polygot programming language, which not only helps developers to have different programming language developed with the microservices, but also have uh, enables the developer toolkit for it. Now we know the benefits of it. Now our journey started to integrating Wasm into Cryo. Every journey has some hurdles. So let's talk about the roadblocks. Cryo as the higher level runtime supports two OCI runtimes, CRUN and RUNC. CRUN, uh, RUNC being the popular lower level runtime in Kubernetes doesn't support Wasm workloads. It doesn't have the native integration with Wasm runtime. And that is where we, uh, CRUN comes into picture. Cryo does support CRUN, and CRUN has a way to run Wasm workloads with, an, with the help of an image annotation. As you can see on the left-hand side of the picture, you can use the image annotation. However, there is a caveat. Passing image annotation down to OCR in time is not, um, it's not an ideal way. When you pass OCI uh, image annotation down to runtime, it might pose some kind of security loopholes where image might try to configure the runtime in a way that you know, uh, basically gives some kind of security stuff. So in order to address this problem, uh, we treated images with WASI WASM as WASM. But before that, I want to talk about the right-hand side where the, uh, what kind of problems we faced while integrating with Cryo. So in Cryo, uh, when the pod gets created, we try to assign the runtime class. For normal workload, it works fine, but when it comes to WASI WASM, if, if the platform of the image is unknown, then that would definitely have some problem. And that's where we come up with the implementation where we treated uh, WASI WASM as WASM by default, and we also introduced a field called platform runtime paths under cryo runtime config, where you can actually mention platform architecture and the corresponding runtime. Just a note here, CRN WASM, under the hood, we are using WASM age as the WASM runtime. Now, uh, with this, I want to show you one uh, demo, and this is still work in progress. There are a couple of patches which are still not upstream, but I want to uh, give you some overview as to what we can achieve with the help of WASM integration. So what we are doing here is we are trying to run AI models within a Kubernetes pod with WASM integration. Can you play the video? So on the right-hand side, I'm trying to spin up the uh, Cryo instance, but before that, I want to show you the Cryo config. So as you can see, can just stop. So uh, in this case, I'm using runtime environment, uh, so you can see in the cryo config, I'm using WASM edge pl uh, plugin mount that is required to run AI models. So uh, I'm using this plugin mount, and uh, as I said, platform runtime parts we have WASI WASM as um, uh, the given runtime. So with this configuration. Yeah. 
So uh, with that configuration, I'm going to spin up the cryo instance and I'll be using that uh, runtime to spin up the cluster. So, um, I'm just forwarding a bit. So here I want to show you the pod spec and before that I want to show you the image and the container file that I'm using. So uh, here is the container file. We uh, usually know that as Docker file. So in this case, I'm trying to set the environment variable, uh, which is required to run AI models. The first one is the plugin path, which is required for Llama H. And the second one is the plugin that we required uh, to uh, run, uh, I mean the model that is required. And I'm trying to run a Llama chat, awesome. Now I'm going to inspect the image that I've created out of that container file. And I'm going to show the platform and architecture for that image, it's Bossy and Watson. Now let's see the pod spec for it. So here I'm simply uh, using uh, image and I'm trying to mount the volume where I'll have the respective model, AI model. I'll go ahead and create the pod. And the pod got created. Let me see the logs for it. Now, as you can see, the model started running. I'll attach that to a container and I'll start conversing with the bot. And the first question I'm going to ask is, what is the capital for North Carolina? Peter, you want to guess? Yeah. <laughs> All right, I think we can fast forward. So under the hood, we are using uh, Llama Edge, like Llama uh, model. And since it's an experimental one, you can get the proper answer, but yeah. All right. So with this, let's transition to our next topic, uh, which is hard enough, Podman in Kubernetes. Here, uh, what makes Podman so special in Kubernetes is its way of running containers. Here, Pod, uh, we are talking about Podman integration. We want to talk about the concept that Podman employs that is running rootless container inside the containers. So in order to achieve this, we want to actually help, uh, take help of a couple of uh, upstream cap that we're talking here today. With rootless containers, we're not only trying to solve the security aspect of it, but also helps in mitigating some of the issues that we are facing for a long time. So the first, I want to talk here is proc mod option. So before I talk about proc mod option, I want to talk about what is proc. It gives your system resources information and Kubelet basically instructs container runtime to mask certain parts under container, uh, under host. So containers, um, the information uh, uh, for host, uh, for containers shouldn't be visible 
information for the host shouldn't be visible for the containers. However, for running the unprivileged containers, we need to ensure that uh, certain paths under proc should be visible. And that is where this option comes into play, where the moment you mention under security context, proc mount unmasked, you'll be able to run unprivileged containers. The second missing puzzle for this is user namespace pods. Here's the GitHub issue for that. What user namespace does is it isolates the security identifiers for enhancing your security. So you, you, uh, you want to run few processes inside the pod that will have different set of ID and GID compared to the one on the host. This will help us in running unprivileged processes on the pods, which might be um, privileged processes inside the pod, which might be unprivileged on the host. And this will definitely mitigate the security because even if the container breaks out, it will still be there under that same user namespace and will not hamper the host specific information. Now I want to talk about the examples. So as you can see on the first two, uh, left two examples, it's about uh, running privilege pod with rootful and rootless containers. In an enterprise ready Kubernetes, those use cases are very important but getting privilege is something very difficult. And that is where we thought of uh, using unprivileged pod with rootless containers. As you can see in the pod spec, we are using annotation, which is supported in, uh, supported in cryo releases. And uh, you need to add SLNX options with type container engine T. So th this is a new label that we have added under container SLNX. And you can use this one for privilege SCC. Here SCC stands for security context constant, which the administrator use for setting the permission for pods. The future work for this is to add custom SCC for running uh, container engine to label. You can also use user namespace pod. As you can see on the left side, the pod spec that we have, uh, you need to have annotation, then you need to mention run as user, then in order to use user namespace, you need to put host users as false. And on the right hand side, we have the cryo config that would be utilized to run unprivileged pod with rootless containers. This setup is still in flux. We might see some changes, but, but if you want to run this as is, you, can, you need US container SNLX package with a, a container engine T label. And uh, we should also have kernel with ID map mounting. And since this is an experimental feature, this is supported in Kubernetes and Cryo release starting with 1.29. So future, like we are excited about Cryo's future. There are a couple of initiatives we are taking. You can definitely go through that uh, QR code and see the future roadmap for Cryo. Here are the highlights where I want to talk about this automatic reloading of mirror config registry. So there's a project called Spiegel. They want to add cryo support into them. So from cryo side, we already started working towards this particular feature. We also want to implement Rust-based NRI framework. We talked about Wasm. Wasm is a big thing now. We want to add Wasm plugins directly loaded into cryo. So, and last but not the least, want to add support for FreeBSD. Yeah, I mean, you can, uh, with this, those who are new to Cryo, try out, uh, we have GitHub, we have Slack, you can scan the barcodes. We want to hear from you how you like it. Do you need any feedback? We are here to uh, address those. And with this, that ends the presentation. Thank you so much for your attention, and we are open for questions. Hello. Hey. Um, I've heard about your talk about the confidential computing part, and I have open questions about that. The first one, where 
are the VMs exactly running? So the VM can run, uh, basically the reason for confidential container at the beginning was to be able to run your workloads in public clouds. So the idea is to be able to run your, your VM in uh, any uh, hypervisor provider and still be uh, confident that nobody can access it. Uh, so this was the root of the project, but you can actually uh, imagine doing that on bare metal too. And uh, if you have the support ha supported hardware, have your cluster run uh, with TDX or SAVSNP and run your VM inside it also. So uh, it works both ways. Okay, so it means it doesn't have to run on the worker nodes, so it can be run on a completely different machine. Yeah, totally. You don't have to run the VM on the worker node, it can be elsewhere. Okay. And uh, how do you ensure a high availability? Uh, that's a good question. I don't have the answer for that, to be honest. Uh, I am working on the virtualization side, so uh, that's a question that I think we should ask to uh, the other member of the, of the uh, confidential comp container uh, team. Uh, they are around you, actually. And uh, we, we also have a talk at 2.30 uh, this afternoon where you can find them. So if you want to ask questions more related to confidential containers, I think this is where you, you should go. Okay, thank you very much. No open questions. So I think we are out of time. So uh, thank you very much. Is there one